All right, welcome back to the Fitz News Studio, another edition of Your Week in Review. Now, we've been covering so many current contemporaneous true crime stories, but this week we're going to go back 30 years to the previous trial of the century in South Carolina, the story of Susan Smith. While we look back, we're also looking forward a quadruple homicide in the South Carolina upstate. Bond hearings were held this week. Our Andy Fancher has got the full story on one of the most gruesome savage crimes that we've ever covered here at Fist News. Stay tuned for an update on that. Last but not least, the somewhat anticlimactic first in the South presidential primary. We're now very close, but former U.S. President Donald Trump came to South Carolina this week. Our Dylan Nolan was there. We're going to talk about Trump's appearance, how it contrasted with former Palmetto State visits, and look at the lay of the land as this key election moves forward. All of that and more heading your way on the Week in Review. On the evening of October 25, 1994, a 22-year-old mother named Susan Smith told police in Union, South Carolina, that a black man had carjacked her at a red light, that he was in such a hurry he didn't have time to let her remove her two children, three-year-old Michael Smith and 14-month-old Alex Smith, from the back of the car. Smith's story sparked a nationwide manhunt including tear-jerking appeals from her, asking for the safe return of her children. But through those tears was a lie. There was no carjacking. Police apparently knew it very early on because the intersection where Smith claimed that this black carjacker pulled a gun on her, apparently that red light never would have happened because of the traffic patterns, the intersections, they knew something was up from the beginning, but the truth of what happened is one of the most horrific murder sagas in South Carolina history. Jilted by a lover who didn't want children, Smith drowned those two young boys in the John D. Long Lake, approximately five miles northeast of Union. She let the parking brake go and let the Burgundy Mazda sedan roll into those dark waters. Now, 10 days after the crime, with the media swirling, with the national manhunt still going, the doors finally closed in on Smith, and she confessed that yes, no one carjacked her, that yes, she was the one who killed her children. A dive team from the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources shortly thereafter, went down into the John D. Long Lake and made the gruesome discovery, the bodies of three-year-old Michael and 14-month-old Alex. This story generated huge headlines. The trial of Susan Smith, an international spectacle not unlike the Alec Murdoch double homicide trial. And it took a jury in Union County only two hours to find Smith guilty. Now, the prosecutor in that case, former 16th Circuit solicitor, now Speaker Pro Tem of the South Carolina House, Tommy Pope, sought the death penalty against Smith. However, that effort was unsuccessful, and Smith was sentenced to life in prison. Now, in fairness, well, we say in fairness, but as a mitigating factor, let's leave it at that. Smith had a tough go of it. Her father killed himself when she was only six, and her stepfather, a very powerful Republican Christian Coalition member, is accused and later admitted to molesting her sexually. Now, Smith, in, what, in one interview, indicated that it was a consensual affair, but it began well before she had attained the age of consent in South Carolina, and according to some reports at the time, continued up to within weeks of the murders of her children. But Smith was also involved with another man, not her husband, who insisted that were they to be together, that the kids could not be part of the equation. This man said he could see himself with Susan Smith, but not her kids. Now this story, again, 
has come up in several occasions over the past few years as Smith, who is serving those life sentences, has made all kinds of headlines from behind bars. There have been drug infractions, but there have also been multiple infractions involving sex, phone sex, text sex. And Smith has a number of male suitors, including some who have promised her hundreds of thousands of dollars upon her release from the South Carolina Department of Corrections. Now, will that ever happen? Well, folks, we're going to find out this fall, November 4, 2024, there will be a hearing. South Carolina parole officials will determine whether or not Susan Smith will be released from the custody of the State Department of Corrections. Smith has made it clear she is going to push for that release. And obviously a number of folks lining up, including her former husband, to oppose her release. And we covered this story this week in the aftermath of some revelations from the Daily Mail, a paper that's covered this news outlet extensively in the past. But the Daily Mail ran a big story about the latest news from behind bars, Susan Smith allegedly engaging in phone sex now with several male suitors, one of whom half her age, Smith is 52 years old now, but a young 27-year-old engaging in some phone sex with Susan Smith, another male suitor, an older suitor promising her more than $200,000, another suitor engaging in some sim game with her, a virtual life in which one of the children on the simulation named Michael. Just awful stuff. But our media outlet has not covered the Smith case up until this week. We filed our first report following up on the big Daily Mail piece. But as this story moves forward, we're going to continue to focus on that key question of whether or not Susan Smith deserves to be released. We've got a shot right here we're going to pull up. This was a poll on our media outlet, you can see exactly what our audience thinks of it. But I want to just say this, as a father of a number of kids, one on the way, be no dice for me. No dice for me. And again, let's assume for a moment that all those awful things that happened to Susan Smith drove her crazy, drove her to a point of madness, drove her to this moment in time where she felt she had no other option. In fact, she claims that's what happened. She wrote a letter, in fact, to the state newspaper in 2015, claiming she's not the monster society thinks she is, that she had a moment of madness. Well, let's assume that. Let's assume that horrific background led to that moment of madness. Let's assume she'd been a model prisoner without all these infractions, without all these dalliances. I still don't think she gets out. But we will find out in November, and we will be covering this case. In fact, we've been making a list of folks we're interested in interviewing, including some of the media outlets that covered this back in the early 1990s. So before the Murdoch trial, before that trial of the century, there was the Susan Smith trial. Again, Fitz News was not around at that time, but we're going to speak to those who were to tell that story and to find out again whether or not Susan Smith's bid to get out of a South Carolina prison will be successful or not. Keep it tuned to Fitz News as we follow the latest on the Susan Smith saga. So as one high-profile true crime saga winds down, we're going to move over a few counties to Anderson County, South Carolina, where another graphic homicide is ramping up. This is the quadruple homicide on Refuge Road. We're calling it the Blood Money Massacre due to what prosecutors insist is the motive for this graphic murder, a mass stabbing, shooting, details of which we're still learning about more than eight years after it took place. Our Andrew Fancher was up there in Anderson County this week, filed a big report on it. We're going to check that out in a minute. But Andy, just diving into this story, one of the most graphic ones you've covered? Definitely one of the most graphic ones I've covered. I think the closest thing to it was maybe a, a double homicide that was very ritualistic, but that was years ago. So to deal with a quadruple homicide in the manner in which the accused couple supposedly did it, which was with multiple knives, at least one gun post-mortem, and then to be charged 
eight years after the fact, it's insane. Well, I want to cut to this just amazing package you put together up in Anderson uh, at a bond hearing for the two accused murderers, two, husband and wife. Um, let's watch this package you put together and then let's talk about it. Here's the clip. The husband and wife duo charged with murdering four family members for inheritance money will remain at the Anderson County Detention Center while Circuit Court Judge Heath Taylor decides their bond. On December 15th, 2023, deputies with the Anderson County Sheriff's Office, or ACSO, charged Amy and Ross Moore Ross Velarde with the quadruple murder of their family on Halloween night, 2015. According to investigators, Amy's mother, stepfather, grandmother, and step-grandmother were individually stabbed and shot more than once while watching TV in their double-wide mobile home. Amy, who lived in a single-wide trailer on the same Refuge Road property, called 911 after supposedly finding her mutilated family three days after the massacre took place. In the immediate aftermath of calling investigators, Amy took to local television to not only recount the horrors of her discovery, but to criticize law enforcement for a lack of transparency. In the coming months, prosecutors say Amy then remodeled the crime scene and moved her entire family inside, despite the fact that ACSO's investigation was just warming up. Amy went on to sue her aunt, and the ACSO for ownership of property belonging to her late family in, quote, access of $100,000 and, quote, lacking of any evidentiary value to investigators. Five years of litigation later, the Velardis were awarded a whopping $34,890 from the approximate $80,000 retrieved by investigators from Amy's personal safe. Come this Tuesday, prosecutors with the South Carolina Attorney General's office say that money was actually stolen from a slain victim and used to pay off debts starting the day Amy called 911. The cash was wrapped, and the bills were wrapped and separated into, de into denominations by year. It's a very specific way of organizing the money. And what was significant about that was that that was the way that the victim, Terry Michael Scott, organized the money in his house. During the search warrant of their house, those wrappers were found in their house. Even in um, a couple of the serial numbers that were on the money that were found in the home of Amy Velarde were serial numbers that had actually been photographed by victim Michael Scott, Terry Michael Scott, not long prior to the murders. While prosecutors maintain that Amy was the mastermind behind this quadruple murder, Lori Murray argued that investigators lack a smoking gun or so much as any new evidence in their case. She furthermore testified that investigators tried eliciting a confession from Ross in the weeks leading up to their arrest and that ACSO's one sentence probable cause affidavit lacks just that. The state has in effect tied our hands in this case without the discovery, without any configuration of what new evidence there is. Our hands are a little bit tied. We also don't get to have a preliminary hearing because they've indicted the case, so we don't get to have the ability to question the probable cause in that manner. I think we're entitled to a preliminary hearing. As for Ross's private attorney, Sean Kent agrees that ACSO's one sentence arrest warrant does not justify probable cause and maintains that investigators have come up with nothing more than a hypothesis eight years without an arrest. What the state of South Carolina has done after eight years is come up with a theory. They've come up with a theory in which they intend, a lot, intend on utilizing in front of a jury, I'm assuming, or in front of your honor. This is our theory of what happened on the case. The problem with theories and the problem with themes is they have to be based with evidence. You can't simply come to the jury and say, they have money, so since they have money, they must have killed him. The state of South Carolina is using a samesies theory with the Alec Murdoch case. Samesies, it was over money, this is over Monday. You have to convict. And that's not what they have. Judge Taylor has since taken Tuesday's hearing under advisement and hopes to rule on the status of Amy and Ross Velarde's bond within the week. For Fitznews.com, I'm Andrew Fancher. So, Andy, we're filming this on a Friday. As of now, no word as to whether Heath Taylor... That's absolutely right. I mean, I called the ACSO spokesperson, which credit to the Anderson County Sheriff's Office for actually answering the media's calls. I have, I have given them props more than once, and I will continue to do so as they continue to answer my emails. In fact, as you know, they provided us with photographic pictures of the victims, which, wonderful, remarkable. So yes, I just got off the phone with a spokesperson who, as of now, says that the judge has not made a decision on the status of that bond, and that when that decision is made, 
they will hear about it about the same time we do, which will be from the attorney general's office. So there's a chance the Velardis could get out. Slim, but there is a chance. I mean, the evidence that the state has that we at least heard in bond court, it was contested. And it's it's a mass discussion on social media, so I've been reading. Mm -hmm. And as we were discussing prior to filming, what are we working with? We're working with money bans, a post-dated check, and some familial disputes. Let me ask you one question, though. Obviously, one of the conditions, uh, not conditions, one of the uh, factors that a judge has to consider in setting bond or deciding whether or not to set a bond is danger to the community. And some rumblings before this hearing about <laughs> one of the defendants being in possession of some shivs, some shanks. Uh, w walk that's, us through what. That's absolutely right. So they accused mastermind behind the quadruple homicide, Amy Velarde was purportedly caught with two shanks in the week leading up to her bond court hearing. And it's worth noting that was on a Tuesday. So that was, of course, argued by her private attorney, Lori Murray. Um, what Lori Murray presented to the judge was that, okay, these were <laughs> these were sizable shivs that were found in her cell, a cell that she shares with two other people. And it was worth noting that she had actually moved cells that Thursday. So one of the arguments was, how does Amy Velarde obtain two sizable shivs or shanks in that short amount of time? And allegedly say, I'm getting out of here one way or another. Oh, wow. That could factor into the judge's thinking, couldn't it? Perhaps, but also worth noting that Lori went on to say that she was not a danger to the community, that she was not a flight risk. One thing that Lori and Ross's attorney pointed out was that these folks have essentially been suspects since day one. So for eight years, I mean, we know that they remained in the house. In fact, they moved into the crime scene uh, within the month of the quadruple homicide. So they remain at the crime scene. Then they get into some property disputes that we mention in the story, which is comical. But they remain in South Carolina for eight years. And then when the sheriff mentions that he has suspects in 2017, they remain still. And then when they were labeled officially as persons of interest last year, they did not run. So that is their legal representation's arguments, which is that they have not ran, that they have remained here, and that they would continue to remain. Yeah, that certainly makes it more difficult for the state to try to establish them as flight risks. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Andy, let me ask you about this. A lot of folks who have followed our Murdoch coverage probably uh, caught that reference made by Ross Velarde's uh, attorney, Sean Kent, regarding the state invoking a samesies <laughs> uh, <laughs> approach to, to yeah. trying to deny bond for, for Ross Velarde. But the tie-in here, the financial tie-in, the attribution of motive being purely financial, these bands of, of cash that, that lead prosecutor Heather Weiss discussed. Mm -hmm. As you watched Judge Taylor obviously taking notes, being very deliberate in his consideration of this, you know, what what did you see on his poker face there as he's looking at the, the motive and the evidence here? Well, before we get into the poker face, I'd like to mention the, the Murdoch angle a little bit, because that was almost a theme in the bond court hearing. Murdoch came up more than once, by both criminal defense attorneys. And it, it was brought into focus when Lawyer Lori, she, she's corrected me, she's told me to stop calling her Lori Lori. But, <laughs> she's uh, famous as Lori Lori. She's Laurie, famous though. as Lori Lori. So anyway, Miss Weiss, um, she brought up Murdoch in that the sheriff was supposedly emboldened by the Murdoch trial, which supposedly pushed him to start prosecuting in this case, or to charge in this case more so. Mm -hmm. So having supposedly said that at some point in time, Murdoch was, was brought into central focus here. And yes, the argument being, of course, the financial crimes. One thing Lori argued was the, first of all, sizable evidence in the Murdoch case. We've got a Snapchat video placing him at the dog kennels. I mean, we've got what that, that heart monitor that was that was monitoring his, his energy levels at that time. She said there's an absence of pretty much everything that we're, we're trying to compare the Murdoch case to in the Velarde case. Mm -hmm. So what we have, again, is money bans, 
a post-dated check, and some financial stipulations, some familial stipulations. And that is what I believe the judge was taking extensive note of. I've never seen a judge take as much note as I saw on Tuesday. Indeed. Well, we've watched Heath Taylor in a number of different cases. He was the judge in a recent high-profile boating uh, mm -hmm. crash, a boat death that resulted in a, a guilty conviction. Uh, Heath Taylor, one of the newer judges, but seems to be very diligent in his approach to these things. So obviously, we'll await his ruling on that. Andy, you've been very aggressive covering this story, just diving into it. I love that. Speaking of your aggressive approach to reporting, you got a little bit of pushback on the mean streets of downtown Columbia, South Carolina, back on Thursday of this past week. Tell us what happened. So I, I, I want to preface, it feels like we're in the dog days of intimidation here. If you're a journalist and you've been doing this for any extent of time, you've likely been threatened more than once. And I have been threatened by some pretty prominent individuals, whether it be professors, city councilmen, spouses of city councilmen, but never have I been threatened to such an asinine level, <laughs> such as I was last night. The, the facts of this case is I was the eyewitness to a BMW, and Dylan, what, what was the so BMW? X5. X5, X5 yeah. a BMW X5, a nice SUV. T-bone an elderly gentleman's SUV, and then slam into the Palmetto Club. That's something you don't see every day. And a, an eyewitness who I was standing next to said there's easier ways to get into the Palmetto Club, so <laughs> I'll give him credit for that one. But following that incident, one of the family members of the female driver, who we've since gotten name and criminal records of, <laughs> oh boy, went so far as to threaten the eyewitnesses. Let's take a look. We actually got a clip of this. Let's... You'll find yourself in a bush in a few minutes. You and you just threatened me now? It's not a threat. That's a fucking promise. What? Okay. I don't make threats. I make it's promises. Okay. Baby, move, 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 baby. Move, 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 move. Listen, the I don't we care. We got time for this. And I, you got, we got baby, a wedding now. Baby, baby, look. I'm good. Dwayne. I don't make threats. I make promises. Okay. So if you don't watch what you say okay, okay. and be careful what you say, yeah. you're going to find yourself over there. Please, y'all back up from each other. Okay? We ain't got time so for your sugar. reason, I'm going to back up from Thank each other. You. you need to. So obviously this guy hasn't seen you your uh, shooting range marksmanship here. Are you and Dylan, I mean, you guys. Well, yeah, Dylan and I, what, we scored 100% uh -huh. on our CWP training courses. So I, I, I was utterly amused. Yeah. by this fellow's threats. I mean, how, how, how is, is, is threats, my presence, promises. a promise, yeah. a promise for the bushes <laughs> amid multiple officers. I, I, I was, I was beside myself. So I, I certainly enjoyed that. Um, again, it was one of the more asinine threats. And, you know, if you, if you're gonna threaten a journalist, just keep in mind that it might, it just might make an otherwise unreportable story newsworthy. Well, and also, you also don't know whether that journalist is a dead-eye shot like you and Dylan Nolan, so I would think <laughs> twice about that. But Andy, great work on the Velarde story. Obviously, you're going to be covering this extensively for us over the next couple months, weeks, uh, as this trial. Uh, we're expecting a trial date at some point, but obviously, as we mm -hmm. await the bond decision. But just great work, Andy. Thank you so much for your work, and we look forward to the next reports on this very soon. So the first in the South 2024 presidential primary was supposed to be high noon, or at least that's what some in the mainstream media were pushing leading up to it. But decisive victories for Donald Trump in Iowa and New Hampshire, a state where former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley was supposed to fare well, have shifted the dynamic of this race. Trump in South Carolina is on cruise control. Just this week, two new polls came out showing Trump with a 35 percentage point lead over Nikki Haley. Also, one of those polls showing a striking uptick in Nikki Haley's unfavorability ratings among South Carolina voters. Again, Haley, governor of South Carolina from 2011 to 2017, and before that, spent six years in the state legislature. I'm joined with Dylan Nolan, our director of special projects, our producer, the producer of this show. Dylan, you were down in Charleston, or North Charleston, rather, this week to see Donald Trump. This is second time we've watched Trump. And I know you wanted to dig into some of the differences between those appearances. But first, walk us through this latest appearance. 
What was Trump doing in North Charleston? Give us the backdrop of that visit. Yeah, so I showed up North Charleston, and it was evident, you know, before the first speaker took the stage that it was going to be a well-attended event. It ended up being standing room only. Um, Donald Trump began his address, and I think the first couple of minutes, you would have thought that he had already won the primary election. He basically worked through, I would say, like a tight five of his his general election issues that he wanted to hit. Of course, inflation, uh, looming Third World War were high on that list, the uh, botched withdrawal from Afghanistan, all the things that you would expect Donald Trump to be capitalizing on here after a couple of years of Joe Biden. It was only then that he pivoted to bird brain, uh, Haley, as he so lovingly refers to her. Now, he was in Conway, I believe, last week, where he went off script and took some real low blows uh, at the situation, which you might know something about, uh, with her husband. He did not do that. He stayed on, on prompter here throughout most of the address. Obviously, he, he went off prompter with a, a number of his remarks, but nothing that uh, got the mainstream media in a tizzy the next morning. So contrast this, though. We saw him in Florence uh, prior to the midterms, uh, another massive gathering, tons of support, obviously, here in the Palmetto State for the former president. But you were remarking there's a different vibe that, uh, well, just tell us what you think the differences are. Yeah, so when we saw him in Florence, this was before the midterms, which folks that aren't, you know, political junkies remember, they didn't go great for the Republicans. It 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 went basically it was a second referendum on Trump, I would say. The the 2020 election was a resounding referendum on Trump, Joe Biden winning 81 million votes, uh historic. And typically, you don't have a great midterm uh when you when you're the sitting president, certainly if the economy is not doing great as it wasn't doing at that point in time. Uh, but people didn't like Donald Trump so much that they demolished the Republicans again in the midterms. And you could feel some of that negative energy uh, in Florence when we saw Trump. Now, his supporters turned out they were there. But I I would just say that there was an undercurrent of feeling like a victim, feeling like he was wronged. And I think that you could feel that both when we were speaking with people in the crowd before the event, after the event, but also in the tenor of Trump's remarks, they they really focused heavily on the 2020 election, which, of course, he's argued for years has been stolen from him, which he is facing uh, criminal charges for arguing was stolen from him uh, in, in Georgia right now. However, now it, it feels completely different. Seeing him in North Charleston, it reminded me more of watching his 2016 campaign addresses uh, when he was t- teeing off against Hillary Clinton. It's clear to me that Donald Trump, when he is able to make the election a referendum on somebody else, performs so much better. Now, and this is regardless of whether you like Donald Trump or think he's the worst or not. It's it's just objective how effective is he. He's far more effective when he is a boxer teeing off on a, a punching bag, you know, whether it be crooked Hillary Clinton or he literally recycled it's crooked Joe Biden now. <laughs> he said, uh, Hillary Clinton, I call her beautiful, beautiful Hillary Clinton now. So I, you can get that Saturday Night Live guy run for his money, man. That's pretty uh, good. I don't know about that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he certainly when he has an opponent to square up against, he's a guy that has more hope in his speeches in a way. And it's funny because you know he's he's obviously deriding somebody else, but that's where he's he's strongest. Well, you talked about the shift in the tone, the different tone, but there's also some different political dynamics as it relates to South Carolina politicians. For example, when we last saw Trump in Florence taking some shots at U.S. Congresswoman Nancy Mace, but now Mace is on the team, a big endorsement of Trump prior to the first in the nation primary in New Hampshire, and he gave her a little bit of a shout out, let her speak, obviously. He let her speak. He let her in the door. She was, of course, working the crowd, working the media. Um but it was notable, and I actually missed this. I got to give a big shout out to Meg Kennard over at the Associated Press, who uh, who got this up on her Twitter. But one of Mace's challengers, Catherine Templeton, was in the room sitting with all of the uh, bigwig elected officials that were invited to the event. So while Trump has uh, certainly boosted Nancy Mace, and he said, you know, we've come a long way in our relationship when he was up on the stage... I don't know that he's made his decision. He hasn't endorsed anybody in this race. Uh, And I'm not sure exactly what he hopes to get out of Nancy Mace between now and when he might might make an endorsement. But he's certainly going to get whatever out of her that he can between now and then. And uh, we'll see which way he goes. That being said, 
she defeated a Trump-endorsed candidate to win election. So I don't know that she will uh, view his endorsement as completely vital to her success. Yeah, certainly the first congressional district, which Mace has represented since uh, 2019, is very much, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, since 2021, rather. This is her second term. But that's a district that's very much uh, sort of an outlier. You look at the fourth district up in and around Greenville. You look at the third district hugging the Georgia border up there in, in rural South Carolina and the north uh, western corner of the state. Those are very staunchly, you know, Republican plus 20, Republican plus 18. I mean, those are hardcore our districts. The first district, a little more purple, although the redistricting this last go round has made it uh, redder than it was certainly uh, during that brief period when the Democrats held it. Looking, to, looking at how that plays into the first and the South primary, obviously it's a split among the delegates. The statewide popular vote winner gets uh, 29 of them, and then the other 21 are broken down by congressional district. As of this writing, we're not seeing Nikki Haley with leads in any of those districts, but if she's going to win one of them, probably be the first, wouldn't it? Yeah, which is why I think it's impactful that Nancy Mace, who, by the way, Nikki Haley campaigned on behalf of as she was facing a, a tough congressional battle, has turned her back on Nikki Haley and is siding with Donald Trump here. Let's talk a little bit about Haley. And I want to ask this question because you've posited some very interesting prognostications over the course of our coverage of this race and uh, you know, talking about what the Democrats would do with Joe Biden. Uh, clearly, we've seen them push him out on the plank a little further since then. Obviously, we don't know what the end game is there, whether it's Michelle Obama, Gavin Newsom, or what their plan is. Did you see that uh, Vice President Kamala Harris ran an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal saying that she's ready to take take the lead here? No mystery what's happening here, is it? Well, it's interesting because I also have read a number of articles this week, I kind of, I think, published in the wake of this, saying, well, there's really no mechanism in place as much as Republicans or whatever political commentators have said, Joe Biden's going to get forced out. There's a lot of top-level Democrats who are arguing, as much as we might want to, there's no mechanism to force the man out. So, and it's it's hard to argue with that. He's the sitting president of the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's a, they call it a coup if you do that, right? Uh, let me ask you this question, though. We're talking about Nikki Haley and her continued presence in the Republican primary. We've looked at Super Tuesday polling. Doesn't look any better for her than South Carolina. In fact, some of those big states looks worse. What is she doing? What is the logic for Nikki Haley at this point to remain in this contest? I can't say I understand that completely. I mean, I can understand the logic of the people who continue to fund her campaign because they're ultimately looking to be an anchor on Trump's candidacy. It certainly doesn't seem like they're very effective in those efforts. But uh, as far as why Nikki Haley's personally staying in, I, I guess that she's going to ride the uh, ride the wave as long as she can. Was it the fact he's old and may die? Is it the fact the deep state may take him out? Is it the fact he might end up in a jail cell? I mean, is she playing the odds that while invincible electorally amongst the GOP monolith, that he's not invincible on those other fronts. Is that her calculus? It certainly could be. You know her better than I do. <laughs> oh, are we going to play these videos? Hey, yo. Now that's accurate. That's a fair. That's fair. So where do we, where do we go from here as far as the this race, Dylan? The so February 24th is election day. For folks who would like to vote in the GOP primary, um, you can actually vote early now. Early voting is going to close on the 22nd. And then formal primary day is Saturday, I believe, the 24th. Awesome. So obviously the outcome preordained, it's only a question of... The margins. Yeah. And we, we're looking at, obviously, the polling we mentioned earlier, likely voters, Trump's up 35%. Uh, there's a crossover campaign, though, of a lot of Democrats. You mentioned trying, trying to be an anchor on Trump. Uh, that could manifest in terms of a crossover campaign, but Dylan. But importantly, the DNC here in South Carolina seems to be trying to shut that down, sending out a message to their members that if you do cross over vote, you're going to be ineligible to participate in any of the formal party functions. So if you want to, you know, be an, an active participant in your local county level DNC organization, if you cross over vote for Haley, you're going to be forbidden for doing that for this uh, for the next two year cycle. Yes, yeah, so that means you can't be a state convention delegate or. Participating in Which I would say most people have no interest in doing that. But if you are the level of person who's 
politically motivated enough to go vote in the other party's primary. Perhaps you are the same type of person who's politically motivated enough to get involved with a local political organization. So let's call this 100 Precincts Reporting in South Carolina, morning of February the 25th. Dylan, what are the numbers? I think it's going to be a very strong night for Donald Trump, and I think that Nikki Haley will still somehow declare victory. <laughs> well, you know, she lost to nobody in, uh, what was it, in the Nevada caucus? Yes. Earlier this month and declared victory, declared victory after finishing third in uh, Iowa. So, yeah. It looks like we might be in for more of the same here in South Carolina. <laughs> but a hollow victory clearly is Donald Trump. Well, and it's clear Donald Trump is going to do well here with the GOP base, which he's spent years, uh, you know, building up a name in. What's less clear is what's going to happen come general election. You know, I looked at the comments underneath the video of the speech that we posted, and our audience has made it abundantly clear. Many of them don't like Donald Trump, and they're not alone there. We're heading towards a presidential race where the both political parties have the lowest levels of support that they've had in decades. Both of the candidates are some of the least likable candidates in, in uh, decades. And we're at a time where institutions across the board in this country are, are, have the lowest levels of trust that we've seen on record. So it's, it's not like we're going to see this slugfest between two candidates, which the Republicans are really love their candidate and the Democrats really love their candidate. And unless something changes here, we're going to see a race between two people that the majority of voters don't like which means that we're going to have a presidency that necessarily is going to disappoint the majority of Americans. Well, we will have some options beyond that. Obviously, let's dispense with the minor party uh, candidates. We'll have Jill Stein, Green Party. We'll have Cornell West running as an independent. Uh, we'll have a libertarian nominee that'll pull, you know, one and a half to three percent, depending on how much. But then that's that's what you typically have. But this election cycle, obviously, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is going to pull bigger numbers than probably any third-party candidate in several cycles. And then the no labels uh, potential for a candidate to emerge there. We've heard Joe Manchin, the Democratic senator from West Virginia, is a possible no labels nominee, but increasingly chatter about Nikki Haley. Now, I don't know how she does that, having pledged in the debates that, you know, if she would participate in those debates, she's not going to run. Well, she's not Trump. known to be a woman of her word. Well, yeah. Well, she said she wasn't going to run against Trump initially and obviously flip-flopped on that. So, But folks touting her as a potential no-label candidate. Dylan, do you see any third-party momentum that makes a difference in this upcoming race? Uh, you know, I mean no disrespect to RFK Jr. I think a lot of the ideas that he's brought to the public discourse are things that would never have been discussed as widely as they have been, and I respect him a lot for that. That being said, I don't see his candidacy having a huge impact Um just because it seems to be pulling about equal numbers from both Trump and Biden. Now, if he if his support, you know, strongly tilts one way, say uh, some of the Trump supporters right now that are telling pollsters they like him, revert back to Trump. And I and I've seen this. People I know who were supporting Republican candidates other than Trump for months are, are you know coming home, so to speak. That could uh, siphon more people off. Uh, on the Democrat side. So obviously there is the potential. I think if Nikki Haley gets in, that's going to siphon uh, more, although I don't know, will it siphon more Republicans or more Democrats? You know, who, who could say? <laughs> so this race, I would say, I don't think that the third party candidates are going to have a huge impact, but they're certainly going to have a larger impact than they've had in any race in recent history. Well, and so many uh, things we don't know yet. Who will those third party candidates be? What sort of momentum could they get? Uh, who will the Democratic nominee end up being? Right. There's so many things. You know, there's we don't not know. usually this many things up in the air in a presidential race. It's really a wild time. We, we're living in a very strange era. Well, Dylan, you've done an amazing job chronicling this stuff. Uh, thank you for going to that rally, for reporting on it. But not only that, you got a great post up uh, this week on the Republican Ratchet. Folks, if you haven't read that yet, a wonderful piece by our Dylan Nolan, some analysis uh, of the post uh, FDR landscape of the Republican Party, just a really insightful, intelligent piece. Check it out. Dylan, you're doing great work. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. All right, folks, that's a wrap for this week's edition of the Week in Review. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We're getting so close to that 50K mark on YouTube. So if you haven't already, click that like and subscribe button. We really appreciate it. 
But more importantly, subscribe to FitzNews.com. That is what empowers all the journalism that we do here at FitzNews.com. It's only 8 bucks a month, but that helps us hold those in power here in the Palmetto State and beyond accountable. Thank you again for tuning in. We will catch you next week on your Week in Review.